So again, though, I think, as we've just seen from that news conference, it feels as though the world has pivoted slightly across that weekend. 300 missiles fired from Iran at Israel. Are we now on the precipice of a new stage of the conflict in the Middle East that's already claimed so many lives? Well, politicians here in the UK are today urging restraint. But at the minute, restraint feels like a pretty elusive concept in a world where our leaders seem to believe that it's a show of power, a show of strength that matters. And watching the news unfold over the weekend and feeling that anxiety that so many of us feel when we look at what's happening in the Middle East, well, it did make me start thinking about the UK as well. And specifically, it made me think back to a show that we did a couple of months ago about the fact that so many in politics and the military believe we're now living in a pre-war and not a post-war world. Are we ready for that? Is our defence capability ready for it as well? What if Donald Trump wins a race to the White House and America stops being the self-appointed policeman of the world? Are we ready for that? It's a question that's occupying politicians here in Westminster. We'll also be trying to find out on the show this evening. First, though, Rishi Sunak has been updating MPs in the last few hours on the events of the weekend. Let's take a listen to what he had to say in the House of Commons a little earlier. So we are working urgently with our allies to de-escalate the situation and prevent further bloodshed. We want to see calmer heads prevail, and we are directing all our diplomatic efforts to that end. Yesterday, I spoke to my fellow G7 leaders. We are united in our condemnation of this attack. We discussed further potential diplomatic measures, which we will be working together to coordinate in the coming days. Well, in a moment, uh, we will hear from Sky's Dominic Waghorn. But first, let's talk to Sky's political editor, Beth Rigby, who is here with us in Westminster. Uh, Beth, what did you make of uh, the position Rishi Sunak was in today? It was really fascinating today, Sophie, because we kind of all went into it thinking, is the Prime Minister going to make a big statement? Is there going to be a new development? And actually, what we saw was this very careful diplomatic dance where he very carefully chose his words, reiterated effectively things that he had said over the weekend and other allies had said. What was going on? I think that it was an element of a prime minister that did not want to throw a match into a tinderbox. When we had a briefing with the prime minister spokesperson this morning, uh, the message was, you cannot overestimate what sort of escalation we might have seen had the Allies, along with Israel and other regional players, not brought down all of those projectiles that Iran and other proxies were firing into Israel in terms of regional instability. And I think what we saw in the Commons there was a Prime Minister who, along with other Allies, is acutely aware that how they react now uh, might impact upon how Israel respond and whether their efforts of the weekend pay off and are successful or not. I think that's where they are. So what was interesting was even though it was a discussion to MPs and in the Commons, the Prime Minister's eyes, all of the language was completely focused on the Middle East, be it trying to reassure regional players such as Saudi Arabia or Jordan, uh, be it trying to reassure Israel and also not poking the bear of Iran. So what you saw in the Commons were, you saw MPs like Ian Duncan Smith and Suella Bravman and Liam Fox, mm. who you're going to speak to in a minute, calling for further sanctions, mm. calling uh, for more movement to prescribe the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organisation. And a Prime Minister just, you know, pushing back on all of that because there is frantic activity clearly going on behind the scenes and on the front of it a determined effort coordinated uh, not to uh, fan any more flames so at the moment he doesn't really care i don't think what his domestic mps this is, wasn't for a domestic audience when it's such a dangerous moment it was mm. all about the messaging to the middle east he's meant to be speaking with benjamin netanyahu uh, within uh, where well, he said shortly, I think that's in the next 24 hours or so, um, and it could be that the Foreign Secretary is also due for a visit. So these are very, very, very tense times. Um, it's, like you say, it's almost as if he doesn't want to throw a match mm. into the into the tinderbox. Um, there were a couple of questions about the UK's own defence capability, mm. and I just wonder, mm. 
in a world that does feel increasingly dangerous, mm. unpredictable, how much pressure do you think there is on Rishi well, Sunak and also, I guess, on Keir Starmer as well uh, to commit yeah. to more I investment? mean, I think you made that point really well in your, your opening thought because what you're seeing is a world in which Rishi Sunak himself said, sort of big picture in the statement, you know, while we look at Iran... Uh, a despotic regime firing attacks into Israel. You have Russia firing missiles and drones and attacks into Ukraine. And actually, uh, rogue states, if you like, are, are growing in force and joining together. Mm. And he tried to frame the conflict in Israel. He linked it back to Ukraine and linked it back to kind of, if you like, multi fronts upon which allies are trying to um, be uh, or seen destabilisation, and I think he did a lot on the language today in the comments. But of course, MPs are saying, "Well, come on, where's the money? Mm. You know, two percent of uh, defence GDP spent on defence." Uh, James Heapy, the latest uh, defence minister to stand down, saying to Deborah Haynes uh, in recent days, we need to lift it to 2.5% and then 3% of GDP by 2030. And of course, Sophie, that drumbeat is only going to get louder as the world becomes less and less stable. Beth, thank you very much indeed. Beth Rigby there, our political editor. Now we're going to be talking to, as Beth mentioned, to uh, the former Defence Secretary Liam Fox a little bit later on the programme, who's calling for further sanctions against Iran, coming up at half past the hour. Let's go now, though, shall we, to Jerusalem and our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, who is there for us. Dominic, what did you make of the latest from the IDF? Well, it's interesting from uh, Daniel Hagari, the Rear Admiral there, talking for the IDF um, from Navatim Air Base, which is one of the only places that uh, this barrage of Iranian missiles and drones and cruise missiles was managed to able to uh, hit. And uh, he, uh, he, I think there wasn't much news made there, but he said that it hit that base, the, or the air base was hit four times and insisted that the damage was only minor. The only uh, video evidence of that was a fairly small crater next to a building which he said had only sort of half been built anyway and could easily be repaired. And the Israelis have been adamant that uh, that damage at that Nevertine Air Base uh, was minor and has not in any way uh, jeopardised the way that base operates. From the Iranian point of view, th th this is a very symbolic target because Nevertine is the airbase uh, where we believe the uh, fighter jets launched by Israel to strike the Iranian uh, consulate building in Damascus, where more than 13 Iranians, uh, including a number of high-level IRGC generals and commanders, uh, were killed. Uh, that was struck by jets sent from Nevertine. Uh, so it was a key target, we can assume, for the Iranians. And they do seem to have hit it, even though the Israelis say there wasn't much damage uh, done. But the Iranians have made a big play about that, and they are presenting what happened on Saturday uh, as a victory, even though 99% uh, of the projectiles sent towards Israel were uh, shot down, according to uh, the Israelis. We heard from the Israeli Air Force earlier in the day, and what they made pretty clear was that uh, it was successful, that operation, to repel Iran's uh, attack, uh, not least because of the help and cooperation of Arab states, either letting Israeli jets into their airspace to bring down those cruise, cruise missiles and drones, but also, in the case of Jordan at least, shooting down those missiles themselves. Now, the Israelis are being pretty careful about what they're saying about what the Arab states did, not, not revealing much detail. But the reassuring thing for the Israelis is that it seems that coalition, not just of Israel's Western allies, America, uh, France and Britain, but also those Arab states, played a combined effort to see off that threat from Iran. And there is a fierce debate underway here, Sophie, between those who say that is a win uh, and that's a win that should be banked and not jeopardised by any further action by Israel. Uh, that's on one side. On the other side, there are more hawkish elements saying that that was such uh, an egregious, unprecedented attack. The first time Israel's been attacked by a sovereign state for more than 30 years, it can't go unpunished. So those voices are saying whatever the allies, like Rishi Sunak, David Cameron and Joe Biden, saying directly to the Israelis reportedly that they should take a wing, whatever they're, they're saying... Israel has to go alone now and to punish the Iranians. Otherwise, it sets a precedent they can't live with. So there's an interesting debate there, I think. What those on that wing of the argument in Israel are saying is that even though Western allies like uh, Rishi Sunak are saying that, that the region must step back from the brink and that any retaliation could lead to a much wider conflict, the longer-term implications for Israel mean that they have to risk that to protect Israel in the future and that that power of deterrence that Israel is so regarded as so important 
to its security and its long-term safety is something that they still don't feel they've shored up enough. And I think, obviously, the outcome of that d debate is going to be absolutely crucial in terms of the uh, immediate stability of the region. Because if those hawkish voices prevail and a more punishing retaliation is carried out against Iranian targets within Iranian borders, you could then see what the Iranian ambassador in the UN warned our correspondent, James Matthews, this morning, would be a, a punishing retaliation in return. Then we could see the sort of spiral of escalation leading to the nightmare scenario of an all-out war across the Middle East. So uh, we're in a kind of hiatus at the moment, but it is a very worrying time as the Israelis in the government Clearly, there are dividing the, the div divisions within those uh, d um, opposing forces within the Israeli government to see which side wins and to see exactly what course of action the Israelis follow next. Dominic, thank you very much indeed. Dominic Waghorn there talking about the different paths open to Israel in this very perilous time. Well, let's bring in our duo for this evening, shall we? The assistant comment editor at Telegraph, Sam Ashworth Hayes, and the former Labour cabinet minister, Ben Bradshaw. Great to have you on the programme tonight. Well, I feel like Dominic sort of laid out the choice ahead, basically, uh, and the two very different responses that we could see from Israel, um, different voices arguing for different uh, responses. Um, ben, where are you hoping that it's going to go? Well, obviously, the, the calm heads and cool heads prevail, and it's going to take an awful lot of uh, detailed and intensive diplomacy, uh, both by Israel's allies, but also by Ira uh, Iran's supporters mm -hmm. in the international community, uh, to bring both sides back from the brink. I mean, it feels to me as if the world is closer to the brink than it's ever been in my adult lifetime. And really? I don't, I don't say that lightly. No, I think this is a very dangerous moment. Um, and you could see a spiralling if the hotheads get control or if somebody makes a mistake. That's mm. how these things can happen. So I really hope that, I mean, I've supported what I heard of what the Prime Minister said in the House today and Keir Starmer in response. Uh, and I hope that America and Britain now actually use the leverage they have on it. The one thing that makes me feel a bit optimistic is that Israel thwarted this attack thanks to support largely from America, Britain, France and some uh, of its allies in the region. So that gives us leverage. We haven't been prepared to really use our leverage with Israel up until now. I think we're going to need to do that to say, look, pull back, you've got to win. Let's get back to focusing on getting the hostages out and getting the situation in Gaza sorted out. Do you agree with that one? I think it's going to be quite an interesting 24, 48 hours, because if you are the Israelis, uh, there has been a direct strike on your soil by a hostile state, and they will feel that in order to maintain deterrence, they must strike back. Um, and there are ways of doing that. this is a more and less escalatory. I believe, from some of the reports coming out, it may be the case that they look to target Iranian nuclear facilities, they look to target perhaps um, a more symbolic strike to military asset. But I would guess, if I had to, that the, the balance of deterrence would be that you, you cannot leave this unanswered. It feels... I was really struck when you said that, that it feels like we're close to the brink at any time you can remember in your adult life. Um, do you think that as a country, Britain's prepared for that? No. Uh, I think we're sleepwalking into potential disaster at the moment. I mean, Russia has transformed its economy into a uh, war economy. Mm. Uh, we are still only at two, just over 2% of GDP. Uh, and I think we're going to have to get real, whoever is in government after the next election with these threats. And, you know, as, as, as unfortunately we are seeing now, Russia is gaining the upper hand in Ukraine. Russia, of course, allied to Iran. So it is a very dangerous uh, co coalescence, really, of, of, of malign forces in the Middle East and in, and in Europe, on Europe's uh, doorstep. And I think whoever is in government, and across, and this is not just Britain, this is across Europe, uh, and indeed America, we're going to have to step up to the plate if we want to defend our democratic values and our, and our freedoms. Just picking up on that, I think Keir Starmer says that he wants to increase defence spending to 2.5%, but only within Labour's borrowing rules. I mean, is that good enough, do you think, for you? Well, uh, let's see what happens if we, if we win the election. But I think, um, I think there's a growing realisation across the, the, the governing class in this country, and, and I hope uh, in the public as well. I, I know things are really tough and we've got so many demands on public spending, but in the end, the defence of our country and of our freedoms and of our democracy is, is, is the most important thing that any government can do, and we're facing some very worrying threats. It is a tough sell, though, isn't it? When people look at the local hospitals, local schools, investment in defence spending can feel a bit far away somehow. It's one of those things that is 
it doesn't feel relevant until you need it. And when you need it, you hope that you spend it earlier. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we are, you know, we're fiddling around with 0.5% of GDP here and there. I think both Labour and the Conservatives have talked about doing this when resources allow is roughly the phrasing. Um, I think we're beyond that point. Mm. It's starting to get to a time when our, our capabilities are no longer sufficient to defend our interests. And we have to work backwards from what those capabilities should be to what we then need to spend. Mm. Um, and that's going to require a massive investment of resources. And I think that is a difficult political sell, but it is the job of political leadership to do this and to tell the country this is what is necessary and why. It's not just the spending, it's also the decisions. I mean, I, it is notable that we took this action to, to, mm. to, to basically blow Iran's missiles out of the sky as they raid in Israel. We're not doing the same to defend Ukraine. It's extraordinary, isn't it, um, the different choices ahead. Thank you both uh, very much uh, indeed. It's been really interesting to speak this evening. Uh, well, let's talk now uh, to someone else who I think will have uh, a lot of things to say on this matter. Uh, as Israel consider next steps, there are some serious concerns about British military cap capability to deal with whatever happens next. We can talk now to the former Chief of the General Staff, Lord uh, Dannett. Thank you very much indeed. Um, ben Bradshaw there uh, just said that he believes we're in the most perilous time that he can remember in his lifetime. Do you agree with him? Well, just picking up on the last conversation that you were having, um, I think with what is going on in Ukraine, Russia's aggression there, the concerning situation in the Middle East and the attack by Iran on Israel over the weekend. And of course, don't let's forget the tensions with China, between China and America over Taiwan. It is a concerning time. And there's been a lot of discussion about questioning whether we as a country are are prepared for war? Well, the answer is, of course, we're not prepared for war. Um, and actually, we don't want to have to fight a war. The big issue, as far as Ukraine and Russia is concerned, and that's the one that really affects us, because we're Europeans, are, after all, is are we spending enough on defence to have a sufficiently significant military capability to deter war, to, yes, help Ukraine defend itself, but much more to the point, perhaps stand with our... NATO allies, the Baltic states, the Poles, the Finns, the Swedes, to make sure that if Putin remains with an aggressive intent, that we can stand him down. And uh, I mean, this is where the parallels with the 1930s actually start to become not just interesting, but actually informative and rather demanding. And um, I don't want to just go on, but I could quote you a figure that I find really quite instructive, and that is that in 1935, we spent less than 3% of GDP on defence when we were trying to appease Hitler. Uh, that failed. By 1939, when the war had broken out, that shot up to 18%. And by 1940, when we were fighting for our very survival, it was up to 46%. That's the disastrous price of fighting a war. What we should be doing is spending 2.5%, 3%, maybe even 4% on defence now. And that's the price of deterring war. And that's what we should be doing to talk quietly carrying a big stick, unlike Chamberlain at Munich, who talked very loudly, just carrying an umbrella. So is that, is that really where you think where we could be, that we're kind of sleepwalking into that sort of similar situation? I, I think that's where we should be. Um, we saw Jeremy Hunt in the spring budget talking about, we'll go to 2.5% when conditions allow. Keir Starmer has mirrored that. Um, but, you know, saying when conditions allow, it's a little bit like um, in a cricket match saying, come on, you can't bowl until the batsman's ready. Well, frankly, um, Putin's not going to wait until we're ready. Uh, he will do whatever he's minded to do uh, when he is ready. And, of course, if he sees that um, our determination is limited, our leadership is weak, our spending is, is low and our military capability is not good, well, then he will take advantage of that, whether it's in Ukraine or whether it's... I was in Lithuania a couple of weeks ago, and they're worried stiff, actually, along with the other Baltic states. They're very close up to Belarus, and Kaliningrad is just down the corridor from them. So, you know, we really have to take our responsibilities as fellow NATO members. And also, we're not just any old NATO member. We're a permanent member of the, one of the five members of the, of the Security Council. You know, we are quite still a big player, and we have to take these things sensibly. Um, you know, I, I know there are priorities in government and health and education, transport and all the rest of it's really important. But the um, first and last duty of government is the security of the nation uh, and the people. You talk about uh, NATO. Um, 
there is a decent chance that Donald Trump wins the race to the White House, that he becomes the next US president, and we know what his view is on what he perceives to be America effectively paying for the defence of Europe. You know, if under a Trump presidency, America doesn't want to be the self-appointed policeman of the world anymore, do you think that we really have our eyes open to what the consequences could be? Well, I think we have to face the possibility that Donald Trump will become the next United States president, although I have to say, I think the um, Stormy Daniels case that's opened um, in the US today gives hope that I possibly might be locked up before then, but who knows. Um, but we have to face the possibility that the traditional knee-jerk response to problems in Europe is for the United States to become isolationist again. Of course, they came very helpfully, but late into the First World War uh, and the Second World War. And the big triumph of NATO uh, since 1945, or since NATO was in, instituted a few years later after that, was that the United States remained in NATO. And that is absolutely critical. But if the US does uh, turn down its support, um, and if it does turn down the amount of money it's prepared to put into NATO, then frankly, it's up to the European members of NATO, who com on a combined basis are pretty rich, to spend more on defence to look after our own collective security. Um, and we just can't get away from that. Of course, we need uh, American support. But frankly, the Europeans have really got to step up to the plate if the Americans step down. Um, just focusing uh, on the events of the weekend, um, the strike on Israel, um, many people also will be thinking about the uh, strike on the Iranian embassy in, in Syria. How close do you think we are to a major conflict between Israel and Iran? Well, I would like to think that wise heads will take us away from a major conflict. If you look at it from the Iranians' perspective, it's not actually in their interests to have a major scrap currently with the United States and the West. I mean, if they wanted that, they could have dialed that up any time. Let's face it, they support Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis. The Iranians could dial that up if they wanted to, but, but they don't, it's not in their interests, and I think they realise that. I think they felt they had to react after the Israeli strike on the consular building in Damascus on the 1st of April, and they did what they did at the weekend. Now, whether it was signalled or whether it wasn't signalled in advance, certainly the Israelis were ready, the Americans through central command with allies were ready, with the result that some 300 odd strikes were neutralized, uh, either by uh, Israeli and international weapons, or that they crashed, such that no one lost their lives in Israel. So I think sensible people would draw a line now under that episode. And frankly, if I was an Israeli politician, um, not on the left, or not on the right wing uh, in the Knesset, I would say, look, the big issue now is we've got to complete the mission in Gaza to destroy Hamas, to remove that threat to our security, and then get on with trying to rebuild our lives and not provoke or be involved in a wider scrap with Iran, which at the end of the day is not in our interests. Many politicians here in Westminster have spent the day telling Rishi Sunak that we're not tough enough on Iran here in the United Kingdom. Uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Liam Fox later. Uh, he wants the UK to prescribe Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist group. What do you think? Yes, I think we should do that. I think the IRGC, by anyone's analysis, um, is rather like the Wagner Group with the Russians over, over many years, is a militant force out for probably Iran's best interests, but not in everybody else's best interests by, by a long chalk. So I think um, naming the IRGC as a terrorist group uh, is, is the right thing to do. But I think we have to keep it in the context of not encouraging and not allowing to happen a major scrap between Iran and the West. Um, I mean, Iran's in a funny old position, really, because there's quite a lot of opposition to the Iranian regime within Iran. Now, we've seen that for the last 10, 15 years. So that regime is on a bit of a knife edge. And um, you know, who are their allies? Well, it's the, the Krinks group. It's China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Well, given that the um, Iranian regime is a fundamentalist Islamist regime, funny old bedfellows, the Chinese, the Russians, and the North Koreans don't exactly all go to the mosque together, do they? Um, so I think they are, they're struggling to find their own route forward. And I don't think their own route forward uh, involves a major scrap 
with the West and the United States at the present time, even over this issue to do with Israel. Uh, thank you so much for being on the programme this evening. It's always really fascinating to get your insight and expertise, so we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. You're watching The Politics Hub, coming up. Liz Truss's memoirs are out tomorrow. They're titled 10 Years to Save the West. In it, she says her husband predicted that her premiership would all end in tears, perhaps showing a little more self-awareness than his spouse there. Uh, we'll bring you some of the best bits later in the programme. Plus, MPs are voting on the government's flagship Rwanda bill later tonight. The law meant to stop courts blocking removal flights. Could it pass this week? Plus, up next, Donald Trump in the dock. Jury selection begins in the former president's criminal trial over allegations he paid hush money to former adult film star Stormy Daniels. Will the trial dent his support? Mandatory evacuation, you must leave! For many people, Harvey is far from over. Christchurch has been changed forever by what happened here. There was a river of blood coming out of the mosque. That's a scene that you don't forget. Ida has certainly left its mark on New Orleans. It just feels heartbreaking. We help you understand the world with us. We are standing on the supply line right into the heart of America's opioid crisis. I've reported from around the world and around the UK. Are you trying to run me over, Sir Philip? No, go away. You look like it, sir. Will you respond to those who've made accusations, Sir Philip? Can you go away? Joe Biden knows the celebrations are over and this is a country in crisis. You don't want to be remembered this way. You always want to be remembered in something positive. It is almost impossible to predict where these fires will go next. This gives you an idea of the strength of those winds, strong enough to bend and twist metal. Do you regret the tweet, Gary? Gary? There's no sign, publicly at least, of either side being willing to give ground. How do you reassure the public that all of these mistakes wouldn't be made again? I'm Greg Milam, and I'm Sky's chief North of England correspondent. Hello and welcome back to The Politics Hub. Now, Donald Trump made history today. He became the first former president to appear in court in a criminal trial in the US, accused of concealing hush money payments made to the adult film star Stormy Daniels. Now, the Manhattan trial may be his only appearance in the dock before the November presidential election. And the former president was predictably ebullient after today's proceedings. This case is nonsense. It should never have been brought. It doesn't deserve anything like this. There is no case, and they've said it. People that don't necessarily follow or like Donald Trump said this is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. Right, let's talk to Sky's US correspondent James Matthews, who's in New York for us. James, it sometimes feels like Donald Trump is like Mr Teflon. Nothing sticks to him. Things that would down other politicians don't even touch the sides. Do you think this could impact his support? I think it could, Sophie, and I say that on the basis of polls that ask that very question. There are uh, clear indications from recent Reuters polls and others in key states that should Donald Trump be convicted, then, yeah, that would sway the views of voters particularly 
those voters who are yet to make up their minds about who they're going to vote for in November. I think we have a situation where there are entrenched views at the extreme edges of opinion. You have the MAGA base, Trump's MAGA base. They've already written off this process as a political witch hunt. You have his opponents who very much believe in his guilt already. There are those in the middle who are, who are waiting to see uh, how this process develops, the evidence that, it's, that is heard, the view of a 12-member jury in a New York courtroom, and the evidence, crucially, as to what lies behind these charges and how does it play out for the individual? How does it play with particular audiences? Evangelicals, that's an interesting one, because this case is all about porn stars, affairs, everything that might offend that particular constituency, one that backed Donald Trump uh, in the past. So there are a lot of moving parts to this, Sophie, um, all pointing towards the verdict, I suppose. And today it's all about the jury that, that will decide that verdict. They, right now, it's been a busy old morning, but right now the jurors, potential jurors, 500 at a time, uh, are being processed through the building. They're trying to sift through them, prosecution, defence and judge, to see who would be appropriate, who can reach a neutral opinion based on the evidence, who doesn't, somebody who doesn't have a background of support for Trump or otherwise. So it's all very complicated. They are filling out questionnaires, being questioned by Trump's defence and so on. They're looking for loyalties either way. Trump just needs one member of a 12-person jury to side with him for the case to collapse and for him to get off the hook. But it's not perhaps the strongest case of the four criminal prosecutions that Trump faces, but increasingly likely, Sophie, that this is the only one that will take place before the November election. 34 counts of falsifying business records. He had this affair with Stormy Daniels, a porn star, allegedly, he denies it. That was in 2006. Just before the election he won in 2016, she was going to go public. Trump sent his lawyer, Michael Cohen, with 130 grand in his back pocket to pay her off, to keep her silence, to buy that silence. That wasn't a crime. What is the alleged crime is that he then put that $130,000 through the books as a legal expense, and that amounts to falsifying business accounts. And according to the prosecution, that is election interference. So he could emerge as a convicted felon. The prevailing view of experts who know more about this than I do, Sophie, is that if he is convicted, he wouldn't serve time in jail, more likely get probation, a fine, community service. Imagine that spectacle. Donald Trump cleaning the streets as he tries to get back into the White House. But should he stay out of jail, then that would clear, leave the path clear for him to continue his presidential campaign. High stakes. It should last about six to eight weeks, they reckon, this whole trial. But right now, jury selection, that will take a week to two weeks. Then they get stuck into the evidence proper. Donald Trump doing community service. What a photo op that would be. Uh, James Matthews uh, in New York for us. Thank you very much indeed. Got to pity those people trying to find a whole jury without preconceived opinions on Donald Trump. That's quite a task. Coming up next on the Politics Hub. From fleas in Downing Street to problems with her Ricardo order. Liz Truss's memoirs are out tomorrow. We're going to bring you some of the best bits. LMPs are voting on the government's flagship Rwanda bill later this evening. Could it pass without more parliamentary ping pong? Up next, back to the Middle East and signs Israel's war cabinet is split over how to respond to the weekend's attack from Iran.
Hello, let's return to the Middle East now and the escalating tensions in the region. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has described Iran's assault at the weekend as a reckless and dangerous escalation, and he's urged restraint. The Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu's war cabinet met today, but so far there's been no final decisions made on how they should respond. Well, Sky's lead world news presenter Yalda Hakim is in Jerusalem for us. She's getting ready for her show, The World at 9pm, a special edition of The World that we're uh, looking forward to watching. Yalda, how serious is the situation and what should we expect to see from Israel? Well, hi, Sophie, from a very windy uh, Jerusalem. As you say, we're here for special coverage throughout the week following that uh, attack that Iran launched on Israel, the barrage of drones, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles uh, over the weekend. And 48 hours uh, since, more than 48 hours now since that attack, we've seen Israel's war cabinet convene yesterday, again today, trying to figure out what the response should be. And We've heard from local media here that the War Cabinet agrees that there needs to be a response, but what they're split on is the nature of the response. How serious should the response be? Now, it's a difficult sort of tightrope uh, for Israel because, of course, they've faced pressure from the international community, from their allies, the United States, and we heard uh, from uh, David Cameron earlier today as well saying calling for restraint, pressuring Israel not to uh, go so far that it turns into an all-out conflict here. The US president uh, in the last 24 hours also said to Israel, see this as a win, take it as a win. This is a success. A number of allies came together, including al Arab allies in the region, namely Jordan. Uh, they helped uh, Israel really bring down a lot of those uh, missiles and, uh, and drones at the weekend. So don't do anything that will shatter that coalition. But Israel, on the other hand, wants to show that, look, something needs to be done. And, and something that I continually hear, Sophie, from Israeli officials, when I speak to them, is that weakness is, is not a good thing in this region. You need to show uh, that you are, are tough. Uh, so it remains to be seen exactly what uh, it is that uh, Israel will do. All eyes now on Israel on the next move. Iran has said, look, you launched an attack on us that killed a very senior commander and a number of other uh, commanders in Syria on April the 1st when they say a diplomatic compound was attacked. This attack at the weekend was in response to that. So if you do anything more, we will respond. So we're going to be discussing all of that with our correspondents and a number of other officials on my show at 9 p.m. So do tune in for that. Well, 9 p.m. then for The World with Yalda Hakim, where she's going to be speaking to the exiled uh, Prince of Iran. Yalda Hakim there, live from Jerusalem. Well, as you heard earlier in the programme, there are growing calls from some in Westminster for tougher sanctions against Iran. Several Conservative backbenchers spoke in the House of Commons today to urge the Prime Minister to prescribe Iran's revolutionary guards. One of them is the former Defence Secretary Cillian Fox, who joins us now from Central Lobby. Um, what exactly are you calling for? Well, for a long time I've been arguing that uh, the Iran is such a toxic regime, uh, not only what it does to its own people, uh, but the way that it's been exporting instability to its immediate regional neighbours, the way it's been sending uh, terror groups, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, to other regional uh, places and, and causing uh, havoc uh, in the countries in which they're based. This is not a new problem and for a number of uh, months now I've been calling in the House of Commons uh, for us to ban Iran Air from flying out of Heathrow. We know that's a, 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 an airline that was used to transport drones from Tehran to Moscow to be used against the Ukrainian people, potentially in, in, in uh, war crimes. Uh, I want to see the Iranian banks operating in the city of London, some of which have already been sanctioned in the United States. Uh, I want to see them s stop functioning because we know that's how the Iranians move their money around and how they help to, to finance 
uh, those groups, those proxies that they have in these different places. And I think that when we've seen actions like this week uh, of the hijacking of a Portuguese flagship uh, in international waters by the IRGC, we can see that this is a criminal uh, and it's a terrorist group and that we need to make very clear our stand against them. What some seem to be saying in Westminster is that actually there's a reason uh, that we can't prescribe this group. Our deputy political editor Sam Coates is uh, saying uh, that, that some in Whitehall say that the UK is quite an important back channel uh, to Iran and that this is partly what is impacting the decision not to prescribe the organisation as a terrorist warrant. Is that something that you've heard? Well, we hear a lot of things, but what we don't get is a clear explanation given to the House of Commons. Uh, we're told that this is something that the Foreign Office doesn't comment upon. Uh, the Americans have prescribed the IRGC, uh, and uh, not long ago the presidential uh, spokesman called for Britain to do the same. Uh, so if there is a strong case for not doing it, we should find out what it is, and we can then decide for ourselves whether we think that is uh, a reasonable argument being put forward. But when it comes to these other entities that I mentioned, I can see no case for not banning them. And you wonder how bad it would have to get um, before we stopped Iran air flying out of Heathrow. What do you make of the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's response to this? Has he been strong enough? Well, the Prime Minister today was very, very interesting in his response because he said uh, during that question session in the House of Commons that a, a number of issues were being discussed with allies and he said to me a number of the items that I had mentioned may well be on that list. So we wait and see. Uh, I hope that we'll get action soon and I hope we also do something about the sale of Iranian oil, which is still happening um, because it's still getting revenue and it's helping to keep the regime afloat and this is one of the most dangerous regimes anywhere in the world. It's a, it's a, it's a thuggish state run by the IRGC with some, some completely irrational and dangerous theocrats on top of it. It makes it in that combination one of the most toxic in the world. It feels to me, just kind of zooming out uh, and looking at the conflict in the Middle East, that we're in quite a perilous moment right now. Um, it's quite frightening to kind of look at what's happening and obviously there is a decision ahead for Israel on how to respond uh, to what happened over the weekend. And there will be some people listening to this who will have been you know, sickened by what they've seen in Gaza, who will have noted that Israel also attacked uh, the Iranian embassy in Syria. What do you think Israel needs to do now? It needs to take a deep breath and pause and we need to have a de-escalation uh, in all of this. Uh, the allies of Israel, the United States, the United Kingdom, France and others uh, made good on their pledge to protect Israel against attack. The last thing we need is to be drawn into an escalation. Uh, and let's put the, point the finger back where it really is due here. Iran engineered the crisis in Gaza because it didn't want the normalization of relations between Israel and other Arab states. And we're now in a conflict in Gaza that no one can win. It's death and destruction whose only beneficiaries are Iran, Iran's proxies and its allies. And that's the big picture we need to keep in our minds. OK, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Liam Fox there. Uh, always good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, today's developments from the Middle East are sure to feature in tomorrow's newspapers. We're going to have our extended press preview and news view from 10.30 this evening, which will have all of the uh, latest developments on the Middle East there. Joining us will be the political editors of The Sun and also of The Guardian, that is Harry Cole and Pippa Creer, on the uh, press preview. Now, we've been talking an awful lot about the Middle East, but the House of Commons has also been debating the safety of Rwanda bill. Now, of course, you remember that, the government's flagship legislation, which is all designed to stop the courts blocking deportation flights to Rwanda by declaring it a safe country. Rishi Sunak has really put this at the centre of his premiership. It was, of course, one of the five pledges uh, that he announced uh, over a year ago now uh, to try and stop the votes. But the Lords are expected to vote down, or the MPs are expected, I should say, to vote down the Lords' amendments to the bills in a series of votes later this evening. What is going on? Let's cross now to Central Lobby. We can talk to Sky's Chief Political Correspondent, John Craig. What is going on, John? 
What's going on is that right now in the House of Commons, uh, they are uh, poised to throw out a series of amendments passed in the House of Lords uh, before Easter. We're expecting about six votes uh, in, what, an hour or so's time, uh, round about quarter to nine, nine o'clock. The government will win them all pretty comfortably. Now, opening this debate, which can go for two hours, the illegal migration minister, Michael Tomlinson, uh, said to MPs, uh, the entire passage of the bill should prevail. So in other words, they're not going to accept any amendments. He said, we simply can't allow amendments that provide for loopholes uh, which would perpetuate the current cycle of delays and late legal challenges to removal. He said, we have a moral duty to stop the boats. So, Tonight, the government will throw out all the amendments passed in the Lords. Then, of course, goes back to the Lords tomorrow. And the key thing about that is what happens then. Well, what we are expecting tomorrow, the word from the House of Lords tonight is that uh, they will send back perhaps three or four new amendments, or very similar, obviously, to the ones they've passed already, to the Commons tomorrow. That will be the latest stage of what we, in the jargon, call the ping-pong. And uh, what's, um, what has uh, happened so far is that the Tories have just been losing vote after vote after vote in the Lords on this, because 30 or so Tories have been abstaining. Uh, then, so if th so three or four amendments get sent back, then we, the, Lord, the Commons will have to vote again on Wednesday, and uh, we expect probably on Wednesday, at some point on Wednesday, the Lords will eventually back down. The Tories, some of those Tories who have been abstaining, will fall into line. Uh, today, the uh, chief uh, top civil servant at the Home Office, Sir Matthew Rycroft, told MPs at a committee the expected, he expected the uh, uh, royal assent for this bill to be imminent, as he put it, and then uh, the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, will outline what happens next. They're not talking about flights in the spring anymore, though. They're talking about as soon as possible. So, uh, as Mr Tomlinson said, there have been a number of delays. John, thank you very much indeed. John Craig there from Central Lobby on the latest on the progress of that Rwanda legislation. Coming up next on The Politics Hub. In her newly published memoirs out tomorrow, Liz Truss says that when the late Queen passed away, she asked herself, why me? It's a good question. After the break, we'll try to answer it. Coming up on the UK tonight at 8, Rishi Sunak calls for restraint on all sides after Iran's attack on Israel at the weekend. We'll be live in Jerusalem and Washington with the latest. Also to come, we'll be discussing the rise of tragedy chanting on the 35th anniversary of the Hillsborough disaster with calls for the offence to be made a hate crime. And we'll have the latest from Staffordshire, where a suspected tornado hit this morning. That's the UK Tonight at 8. It's insane, honestly. I've been a normal wave surfer, I guess we'll call it at this point, uh, since I was nine years old. So this crossover into the big wave surfing has been... Uh, yeah, just like a natural progression, I think, as I have grown as a woman and, um, yeah, just found a bit more power from within. It's just kind of led me to this big wave world, which is so many different things, adrenaline, yeah, just everything. I started training for big wave surfing, so it's a little bit different to normal surfing. Normal surfing, you obviously paddle, use your arms, and that's how you get into the waves. With this stuff, you have a jet ski with a rope on the back that you hold on to. It goes about 70 kilometers an hour, and you just hold on, and you decide whether or not you're gonna let go. So I started doing this in June, which was a pretty quick wow. um, progression, and, and uh, yeah, to surfing Nazare then in, in the November for the first time, and then I caught the, the big wave more towards the end of the season. I think probably the first time in my life that I felt that much pride, um, mm. and just the reaction that I've had from the UK and just like women as, as a whole and how they've kind of said that it's inspired them to go after their 60 foot wave and whatever that is. So I think as much as the wave felt incredible for me on a personal level, I think how it's kind of now evolving into, into lots of other things and the kind messages and everything that I've had has been, yeah, it's all together been just incredible. They basically have to have an object like in front. So usually with us, it's a jet ski that they can Oh. kind of guarantee that the jet ski is this size and they okay. can kind of like so it's a certain amount of jet skis so I don't know like 12 jet skis uh, and that's how they do it so for the Guinness record it is um, yeah 
measured by jet skis effectively. <laughs> I'd uh, been in sport since I was 15 years old competitively and I think that took a real hit on my mental health. I really struggled with an eating disorder and, and back in the days when I first started surfing, it was over 20 years ago, there wasn't much representation for women and we were definitely valued more for our appearance than our physical ability. So uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a journey for sure. I, I took four years out of surfing just to kind of find who Laura was outside of that. And yeah, I just... Uh, pulled me straight back in but it is it, as I said it's been amazing to have the support this time round as an athlete. Hello and welcome back to the Politics Hub. The wait is over. Liz Truss's memoirs are out tomorrow. They're available in all good bookshops. She may have been Prime Minister for just 49 days but she certainly made her mark. She's never boring, our Liz, and true to form her book 10 Years to Save the West is full of surprises. So we thought we would quiz our guests about some of the revelations. Feel free to join along at home. So this is how it's going to go, right? I'm going to pose a question, the answer to which is hidden in Liz Truss's memoirs. Right. All wrong answers acceptable, uh, all guesses acceptable. Uh, I'll let you know the, the correct answer uh, after. So this is the first one. This is the first question buried in Liz Truss's memoirs. Why, according to Liz Truss, why was number 10 unwelcoming? Fleas. Fleas, Very good. Or the, or the, or the, she had to put up with some Ikea, Ikea furniture or something. It's absolutely right. <laughs> absolutely right. So, even less welcome, says Liz, the place was infested with fleas. Some claimed that this was down to Boris and Carrie's dog, Dylan, but there was no conclusive evidence. In any case, the entire place had to be sprayed <laughs> with flea killer. I spent several weeks itching. I mean, to be fair, that does actually sound quite grim. Yeah. Yeah. I feel so sorry for her after the, after the damage she did to the country. <laughs> oh, shucks. Poor, poor Liz. <laughs> I want to try and find out if it was down to Dylan. Maybe we should try, I don't know if you've got Boris or Carrie's number, we should try and find out if he's been unfairly smeared here or if there is actually any proof to this. Uh, right, next one. Number two. Who was the saving grace at number ten? The cat. I'm going to go with the cat, Larry. The cat, Larry. You know what? Oh. This is. I thought this was really hard. I looked at this question. It's like, blimey, they're never going to get these. But you're absolutely spot on. <laughs> Completely right. Oops. The saving grace at number ten was Larry the Cat. He's a lovely character and seems to take a liking and disliking <laughs> to all of the right people. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Larry, obviously a fan of Liz. You guys, cat people, dog people. Dog person. Dog. I have to say, as someone who's spent a lot of times uh, stuck outside uh, number 10 in the cold, uh, Larry, Larry's great. I'm a fan of Larry, I have to say. He's always... My favourite Larry uh, thing is when he goes to the door at number 10 and then the policeman have to literally open the door, like, as if he's, like, a visiting prime minister or president or something. He's just sitting there waiting. Yeah, great. Right, number three. This is an impressive... Have you, have you, been, re have you been reading Liz Truss's... Uh... No, 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 I just read some of the experts in, uh, in the papers. <laughs> what she right, number three. What did Liz Truss find hard to organise? Her budget. Her budget? No. Oh, well, that actually, yeah, I see what you did there. An avocado delivery. That's actually very good. <laughs> yeah, the budget. That's a very good answer, <laughs> to say. It was quite difficult to her. Um, it, was an, it was an avocado delivery. It was an avocado delivery. They didn't, they didn't, didn't believe she was calling from number 10. And, uh... Very hard to deliver. Uh, there's also other things that she found uh, very difficult to deliver, along with the avocado uh, delivery. I found the lack of personal support for the Prime Minister pretty shocking too. Despite now being one of the most photographed people in the country, I had to organise my own hair and makeup appointments. I, I admit, I've got a bit of sympathy here, yeah. to be honest. I, I remember, like, Hillary Clinton talking about uh, the kind of time, um, you know, penalty that female politicians have in spending, you know, having to get their hair done and having their appearance ripped apart. So I've got a little bit of sympathy, I have to say. I mean, I did my own hair coming on. It's a disaster, <laughs> so... Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely fun. We do have a wonderful makeup team at Skybook. They did say. very well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they always do very well in the circumstances. Finally, when was Liz Truss happiest? What was her happiest moment as Prime Minister? I don't remember. I mean... The relief that it was all over? Yes. <laughs> the relief that it was all over. <laughs> that would be quite good. Uh, actually, that's not right. Uh, Liz Truss's happiest moment as Prime Minister. After a bruising leadership campaign and the disappointments of successive Conservative governments, we'd finally delivered a package of tax cuts and reform that was going to signify a new era. Looking back, that afternoon was probably my happiest moment. But it all ended in tears. I mean, what an extraordinary thing to say about that budget that did so much damage. I mean, in, in retrospect, everyone has completely trashed. 
What would you say to that? Have you got any more sympathy for Liz Truss? Or I do, you, uh... I do. I, I thought some of the policies in the budget were quite good, but executed poorly. And I, so I still sort of stand by that. So possibly right policies, wrong person. I have to say, I love the little dig uh, at the failures of successive Conservative governments. Not her own, obviously. Uh, thank you both <laughs> very much uh, for a very lively Politics Hub. It's been great to have you on the show this evening. Well, that is it from us uh, tonight. So it's great to be back in the seat and I will see you tomorrow at 7pm. Up next, it's UK Tonight with Sarah J. Me. And after that, of course, we have Yala Hakim from Jerusalem for a special edition of The World. I will see you tomorrow, 7pm on the Politics Hub. <laughs>